Genesis 9. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground, and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you, as with the green plant I give all to you. However, flesh with its life, that is, its blood, you shall not eat. Surely I will require your life blood. From every living thing I will require it, and from every man, from each man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, swarm on the earth and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, As for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth. Indeed, I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, and there shall never again be a flood to destroy the earth. Then God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am giving to be between me and you, in every living creature that is with you, for all successive generations. I put my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it will be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. So the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was a father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was scattered abroad. Then Noah began to be a man of the land and planted a vineyard. And he drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Then Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took the garment and laid it upon both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were turned backward, so that they did not see their father's nakedness. Then Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. And he said, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived three hundred and fifty years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were nine hundred and fifty years, and he died. Genesis 10 Now these are the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz, and Riphoth, and Torgamah. The sons of Javan were Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, every one according to his tongue, according to their families, into their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, and Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, and Havilah, and Sabta, and Ramah, and Septeca. And the sons of Ramah were Sheba, and Dedan. Now Cush was the father of Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yahweh. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before Yahweh. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Kalna, in the land of Shinar. From that land he went out to Assyria, and built Nineveh, and Rehoboth Ir, and Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is, the great city. Mitzrayim was the father of Ludim, and Anamim, and Leabim, and Neftuim, and Pathrusim, and Caslehim, from whom came the Philistines, and Kephtorim. Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, 
in the Arvadite, in the Zemurite, in the Hamathite, and afterward the families of the Canaanite were scattered. The border of the Canaanite extended from Sidon as you go to Gerar as far as Gaza, as you go toward Sodom and Gomorrah and Admah and Zeboam as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their tongues, by their lands, by their nations. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, and the older brother Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem were Elam and Asher and Arpachshad and Lud and Aram. The sons of Aram were Uz, Hul, and Gether and Mash. Arpachshad was the father of Shelah, and Shelah was the father of Eber. Now two sons were born to Eber. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan was the father of Almadad, Shelah, and Harzameth, and Jerah, and Hadoram, and Uzal, and Dikla, and Obal, and Abamiel, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. Now their settlement extended from Mesha as you go toward Safar, the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their tongues, by their lands, according to their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations, by their nations, and out of these the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Matthew 9 And getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? For which is easier, to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins, then he said to the paralytic, Get up. Pick up your bed and go home. And he got up and went home. But when the crowd saw this, they were afraid and glorified God, who had given such authority to men. And as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And he stood up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the attendants of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined but they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a synagogue official came and was bowing down before him, and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she was saying to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be saved from this. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has saved you. At once the woman was saved from her hemorrhage. And when Jesus came into the official's house, he saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder. He was saying, Leave, for the girl has not died, but is asleep. And they began laughing at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, coming in, he took her by the hand, and the girl got up, and this news spread throughout all that land. And as Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? 
They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him throughout all that land. Now as they were going out, behold, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. And after the demon was cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, He cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Ezra 9 Now when these things had been completed, the princes approached me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, according to their abominations, those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed has intermingled with the peoples of the lands. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the officials have been foremost in this unfaithfulness. When I heard about this matter, I tore my garment and my robe, and pulled some of the hair from my head and my beard, and sat down in consternation. Then every one who trembled at the words of the God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the exiles gathered to me, and I sat appalled until the evening offering. But at the evening offering I arose from my affliction, even with my garment and my robe torn, and I fell on my knees and stretched out my hands to Yahweh my God. And I said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you, my God, for our iniquities have multiplied above our heads, and our guilt has become great even to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day we have been in great guilt, and on account of our iniquities we, our kings and our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, and to plunder, and to open shame, as it is this day. But now, for a brief moment, grace has been shown from Yahweh our God, to leave us an escaped remnant, and to give us a peg in his holy place, that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are slaves, yet in our slavery our God has not forsaken us, but has extended loving kindness to us before the kings of Persia, to give us reviving, to raise up the house of our God, to restore its waste places, and to give us a wall in Judah in Jerusalem. So now, our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken your commandments, which you have commanded by the hand of your slaves, the prophets, saying, The land which you are entering to possess is an impure land, with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations which have filled it from end to end, and with their uncleanness. So now do not give your daughters to the sons, nor take their daughters to your sons, and never seek their peace or their prosperity, that you may be strong and eat the good things of the land, and leave it as a possession to your sons forever. After all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and our great guilt, since you, our God, have required us less than our iniquities deserve, and have given us an escaped remnant as this, Shall we again break your commandments and intermarry with the peoples who commit these abominations? Would you not be angry with us to the point of destruction, until there is no remnant nor any who escape? O Yahweh, the God of Israel, you are righteous, for we have been left an escaped remnant as it is this day. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for no one can stand before you because of this. Acts 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, it happened that when he was approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. 
and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And the men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. Leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise up and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And he laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord sent me, that is Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you are coming, so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he rose up and was baptized, and he took food and was strengthened. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be astounded and were saying, Is this not the one who in Jerusalem destroyed those that called on this name, and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this one is the Christ. And when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to put him to death. But their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night, so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall, lowering him in a large basket. And when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and recounted to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. So he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brothers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria was having peace, being built up. And going on in the fear of the Lord and in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it continued to multiply. Now it happened that as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. And there he found a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years, for he was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise up and make your bed. Immediately he rose up. And all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charity, which she continually did. And it happened at that time that she fell sick and died. And when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. Now since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, pleading with him, Do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, crying and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up, and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. 
And it happened that he stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. 